welcome everybody to the LA West Side Blender Meetup Group. For folks that are joining us virtually, we have seven people here in person and about, it looks like uh, three or four online. We, we usually do kind of a what's new in Blender in the Blender community. Then we have uh, Sean Kennedy is coming in. We don't have him in the room yet, but uh, he's coming in to do color control and visual effects with no groups. So Sean's a, a compositing artist that used to work for uh, Rhythm and Hues, and uh, he's been involved in getting some new node groups added to Blender. I'm going to be covering uh, time-lapse animation using HDRI sequence environment maps. We're going to try something new here. We're going to do an add-on potluck. So if you have a favorite Blender add-on, uh, come on up, show it to us. You know, if we need to download it quickly, we can do that. If it's built into Blender, even better. So have a think about that, you know, and we're just looking for, you know, five-minute presentation. The add-on community, the add-on uh, ecosystem is getting quite large these days, and there's some pretty cool stuff out there. So, you know, we thought we'd give it a try. We'll see how it works. And then we have uh, Sam talking about some of the visual effects work that he's been doing and maybe give us a demo of that. All right. And of course, this is meant to be interactive. We're a small group, so stop anybody anytime for questions. Um, you know, if you have additional information to add, pitch it in. I'm gonna breeze over this slide because everybody in here is familiar with Blender, but uh, in our bigger meetings, sometimes you know we get up to 20, 25 people, depending on how much marketing we do before the event, and there's usually somebody in the room that's never seen it before. So usually what I do as a rule of thumb is I, Show Blender <laughs> before we get too far into the meeting, uh, because we're all familiar with Blender. Uh, again, I'm going to skip over this. Um, this is 2.72a, which literally just released this week. So, with some really exceptional splash screen art by Mike Pan. So, um, this particular image happens to be part of his. What was it? It was a default cube contest where I think he spent like a month or more, I forget, I think it was like 30 days of creating artwork with nothing but the cube. And some of the stuff he did, <laughs> hi, hi. that was good, yeah, no, that's all right. Some of the stuff he did is absolutely amazing. I recommend you go check out his site and look at it. Mike Pan's pretty talented, and he does a lot of really cool stuff. Um, some developments since our last meeting, which was in August, 2.72a uh, is now out. Uh, there's some really awesome features in that. Um, there's been a lineup announced for the Blender conference, which is happening this month in Amsterdam. For those that have not tuned into that, they post all of their sessions online, or I think most of them, but awesome content. Uh, there's a new product called Fluid Designer, uh, which is based on Blender, and it's a, uh, a product for doing rapid prototyping and designing of uh, interiors. And it's pretty cool. They've radically changed the UI so you would not even know it was Blender when it first fired up. I mean, after using it for a little while, you'll notice that there's clearly Blender running under the covers, but it's pretty awesome. I recommend you check it out. It's free. Gooseberry Weeklies uh, have been really entertaining. Is anybody following this project? Yeah. yeah. So Gooseberry, for folks that don't know, is uh, the Blender Foundation does an open film project once every few years. Uh, they're currently uh, doing a, a pilot. I think it's it's been renamed now. It's like yeah, it's called uh, something laundromat. So. Yeah, Cosmos laundromat. Cosmos oh, laundromat. That's right. Yeah. If if you're a member of the Blender Foundation's cloud, um, you can actually get access to all of their assets as they're producing it. So from the artwork to the models, every week they have a, a weekly meeting that they run out of the foundation in Amsterdam, and they they broadcast that live and then send up the recordings to YouTube. Pretty, pretty entertaining to actually watch that work. So one of the cool things that's been happening over the last uh, couple of weeks has been hair development. So the main character in that film is a sheep. Uh, the hair system in Blender uh, has needed some love for a little while, like things like self-collisions and, hey, how's it going, John? Uh, things like self-collisions and stuff like that, uh, and it's getting it. So it's really nice to see that evolving. There's a lot of kind of uh, nice walk cycles and stuff coming up. CG Cookie has started uh, posting these really epic like feature overviews of each release of Blender, which is kind of disincenting me to give them here <laughs> because they do a much better job than I do. Uh, Gottfried from Blender Diplom uh, has been doing those lately. The 2.72 overview was like 14 videos. It's like he dives into each one and demonstrates it. And so uh, if you haven't checked them out, I recommend you do. 
there's a new version of match, a uh, track match blend that's been put out. Um, so this was a uh, motion tracking tutorial series that was sold by DVD by the Blender Foundation. They've updated it because that part of Blender is moving very quickly. Uh, they've posted it to the cloud. So if you have access to the cloud, you have access to all of their, their training content. And I haven't had a chance. Has anybody looked at this yet? Uh, yeah. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, what do you think? It's good. It's great. It's great. It's so much has changed since the previous version, the interface, everything. Yeah. So it was in need of an update. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the minute I think I watched the old version of this, there were like updates to Blender, and then suddenly it was like the whole, like the UI changed. And so, yeah, I'm glad. Um, that is, who is it that teaches that? Sebastian, Sebastian Koenig, right? Um, I met Sebastian in Amsterdam, actually. Uh, he does a really good job with those videos. Uh, also, um, Blender Guru published something called the Modifier Encyclopedia, which is really nice. It's kind of a one-page overview of all the default modifiers uh, that are built in. That's these guys here. So uh, in terms of add-ons, right, there's just boatloads of add-ons that are developed in between our meetings, and we don't have time to cover all of them here. I, I usually pull out just a couple that I think are cool just to demonstrate the kind of stuff that's happening. Um, there's something called Sniper, which is a kinetic typography add-on. So if you ever see the kind of rotating text, um, it does so much for you uh, automatically that it's it's really an amazing add-on. Uh, I would love to even maybe demonstrate it during one of our future meetings. But again, uh, the guys at Blender Diplom have done a really good job of putting up a bunch of tutorials about how to use that. I thought I'd highlight uh, B-Light Studio which is an add-on that does HDR labs style um, HDR lighting uh, setup in Blender. So this is a, a screenshot from it here. Uh, we're going to be talking about HDR lighting in a little bit later, but, but basically they have uh, all of these HDR lamps that are set in different uh, sort of styles, and you rotate them into the scene and rotate them around your object. Pretty cool. Uh, there's a demo I have a link here. I could provide if you want to go check it out later. Uh, lots of contests that happen all the time. Blender Nation has weekend contests these days. Uh, Bart's been running. Some of the results from that have been pretty cool. And uh, of course, we're all voting on Suzanne Award, which is like uh, usually indie shorts uh, that are done, and they they vote. We've all vote. The community votes on them, and then awards are given at the Blender Conference. So if you have any content that you want to submit. I think I don't know if we've missed the window, but it's very, very close. So I would get it. I would get it up there. And as always, uh, CG, visual effects, gaming, development jobs. Uh, SIGGRAPH does a really good job of doing a job posting here. It kind of pulls it together. Anything else? What other kind of news do we have from the community? Not it. Blend for web. Blend for web, yeah, that's a cool, that's a cool, yeah, can you describe that for everybody? It's like, a, it's an add-on to Blender that allows you to easily, I think Sam, you told me about it first, and then I looked into it, but it allows you to export game engine stuff to like HTML5, oh. so you develop it in the Blender game engine, and then you can export it. Yeah, open, there you go. So it looks like blendforweb.com. You know, before I kind of wrap up, I think it sounds like, again, we're all Blender people in here. So I'm going to spend very little time on this. But uh, main Blender org site, Blender Artist, where everybody talks about Blender. Uh, it's the forum. Blender Nation is your New York Times Blender. Uh, CG Cookie is like your uh, some free, some paid for uh, short training, which is good. Uh, Blender Guru, which is all free training, uh, although they, they offer some paid for courses that are longer, uh, that I'll, I'll be talking about one of those uh, today. And then BuildBot is where you get your experimental builds, which have the new features before the next release. All right. Cool. All right. So with that, <laughs> all right. So am I bringing my computer or just the USB drive? Bring the USB, because we're all set up on Zoom here. That way people can see what you're doing. Uh, Question, yeah, of course. Do enough they incorporate more support for OpenCL in the Blender for like AMD cards? Uh, yeah, I think I can answer that. Does anybody else want to? No, okay. So, uh, so uh, there is 
Cycles OpenCL support. Um, it's experimental at this point. Uh, at least it was at 2.71. You use a flag to enable it. And it fully supports like the OpenCL GPUs on Intel processors. Um, I believe people have been struggling with AMD cards and uh, they're struggling to get the Cycles kernel compiled for those cards. It's in AMD's camp. Uh, Ton Rosenthal has been trying to rally the community to just annoy the heck out of AMD, AMD to get their uh, house in order. Uh, but that's that's kind of anybody else want to add to that or yeah, yeah. Like, you know like a no <laughs> situation <laughs> where stuck there for ages. It is yeah. It, well, I will say if you want OpenCL and Blender, there are other rendering engine options. So our last meeting, uh, Sam did a great presentation on Octane. Does that do OpenCL? Yeah. It does not. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> so uh, Lux Render is where I would point you to. So they uh, publish their benchmarks with AMD cards. So you can do OpenCL with that. Um, I, I forget is B-Ray. B-Ray must support OpenCL, right? Huh. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't checked, but either way, uh, there's a. I think you could use V-Ray with Blender. There's other options. So, does anyone use Blender for compositing at all? Yeah, like visual effects stuff. Yeah, a little bit. I know. Yeah, yeah Sam. <laughs> Sam's all over it. What's that? More. We'd like to do it more. Okay. Um, yeah, there's there's still uh, there's still some very fundamental things missing in it that it could use that I'm pushing them a lot every day to try and get some of that stuff. So I thought I'd show. Um, I've come up with like these little, I have, I have a node that I created um, for a color correction uh, with some help from Sergey for the math stuff. And it's, uh, it's pretty useful, I think. And uh, so I just thought I'd show it and I've been using it a little bit on the feature I've been on. And then uh, I have like a technique for doing film grain I thought I'd share too. Because uh, Blender is in dire need of a film grain node. Um, and it, uh, my little cheat uh, it doesn't have very many settings. You can't adjust anything, but it'll get you a film grain uh, relatively quickly. So, uh, and all inside Blender. So, um, I guess I could, I could see. I'm trying to get used to the mouse. Um, there's a oh, where's uh, documents, Sean? Anything? Oh yeah, sorry about <laughs> No, no, I'll find it someday. <laughs> Got to be around here somewhere. Uh, do you see the add-ons shortcut? Add-ons. Go up one. Sean. Sean. Ah, I got it. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Hopefully this packed okay. Um, oh, I brought Sunbeam stuff. If anybody wanted to see that kind of stuff yeah, too, but uh, Sunbeam. Yeah. Because you're sitting in a dark room. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this isn't. This is just two images. This I didn't make this. Alien. I just grabbed it online a long time ago because. Uh, I wanted something that uh, was very different from the background, uh, like where the lighting obviously doesn't match. Oh, come on, I can't, uh, I can't drag your middle mouse buttons all weird. Oh, well, hopefully that's good enough. Um, well, I could do this, I guess. Uh, right. Tell me it's not working, and I will yeah, fix it. Yeah, I can do it old school. Old there we school. go. Um, so all this is just a background with this alien thing over it. Oh, that's so weird that your middle mouse doesn't work. Is it? No, I don't know. I can't like pan around. Oh well. Um, so hopefully you can see that enough with this out of the way. But there's this technique that uh, I'm an After Effects user as well. Uh, that's like my main thing. And there's this technique that this guy Mark Christensen, who's like from ILM and stuff, he came up with this technique. Well, I don't know if he came up with it, but he's the one that kind of popularized it, at least to me, where you take uh, you take a levels adjustment, uh, and you look at each channel. You put your two images together, and you look at each channel individually. You look at the red channel, um, and you compare the lights and the darks. So you want to get them. You use each individual channel of the levels control to kind of uh, you know make the foreground elements blacks and whites match. Uh, and it's very simple. You don't like. You know, you could use curves as well, but you don't put any actual points on the curve. You just keep it linear and kind of move the, the black and white points. And then once you've got the red channel looking good, you go to the green channel and get that matching. You want, you'd want the highs to match the highs. Um, and then the same in the blue channel. And when you're done, 
Oh, new newer mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, try that middle mouse button. Yeah. See if that works for you. Oh yeah, there we uh -huh. go. Right on. Right on. Um, so, uh, so yeah, once you do that in every channel, you go back to your main color channels and look at it, and hopefully it's in the ballpark. It's it's much. It should be much closer to matching your background uh, than when you started. So, uh, I I was I was trying to set that up in Blender uh, using. We don't have a levels node, uh, so we've got the curves node. And uh, there's a way though that it, it can't. If you look at a curves node, uh, curves. You have your values. Oh, don't put that there. Jeez, man. Come on, come on. Um, there's these values. If you move them, you see these values appear. These are what you want to adjust. Are these just these endpoints? But there's no input to these, so I couldn't put this into a node group and connect the inputs to the to that. You know, so I could get to it from without opening the group. Um, and that's where Sergey came in. Sergey is like, oh, it's just simple math, and hooked up a few math nodes, uh, which you can see here, simple math. Uh, and he hooked these up and said, yeah, this this will do it. Um, so once once that was working, then I put together the rest of it, and uh, and it works really well actually. So if I I'm just going to drop it in right now, it's in line, and with everything set uh, to the default, all blacks to zero, whites to one. It doesn't change a single thing, um, and then you you basically go through each channel, and uh, and you, these will control. Like if I turn this up, you can see the blacks get lifted. If you turn it down, the blacks will get darker. Um, so I've, I just to save time, I kind of wrote down all the ideal settings for it. Uh, so I hope that doesn't count as cheating. But uh, oh, another one. One. Uh, the blacks were all really subtle in this, but the whites were the main thing, uh, like taking them down really far. So you can see, like once I just do those two uh, on the reds, the red, the blacks and whites, you can see like the, the brightest parts of this guy. I guess the sky is a bit brighter, but I was kind of looking at this car, and the house, uh, all the brightest stuff in there, and trying to get it sort of in that ballpark. There might be some spots here on his ear that kind of get more into this range or not, but. Uh, and then you just go through the channels and do that same exact thing. This one's 0. 0.420, so that's down pretty low. And then this one I just raised very slightly. Uh, the blacks, I think when I was doing the blacks, I was looking sort of like in his eye in here, and I was kind of comparing it to this post or some parts of this tree back here, or this wheel well. Uh, and there's some dark stuff down here too in his armpit thing. Uh, and then the blues, if we look at the blue channel, blue is way too bright. Uh, blacks, I think, were okay. But the blue turned down to 0.6, the whites. And then when uh, – that's still probably a little too bright, um, like looking at his shoulder compared to the hood, but it's not bad. It'll work. So if you go then back to the Keller channels, he kind of already fits in that world much better. Uh, and then I uh, – uh, I threw this out. There's a VFX list, like an email list of a few, a bunch of us that talk about visual effects stuff once in a while, uh, and you know how it works in Blender. And I threw this out to them, and another guy, I can't remember his name now, uh, came back and with an easier, even easier way of just a way to plug in some Keller wheels to it. Um, so I haven't had time yet to build that into the the Node group, but it's it's super easy to set up. You just take uh, two. Two of these, set one to white, one to black. Um, come on. There we go. And you take a split RGB, if I could grab it. Get another one. And then one of these is going to control all the whites, and one of these is going to control all the blacks. So you just plug them in, red to red, green to green. Blue to blue, same thing on this. Oh, come on. Is that mouse it's a little tiny, but it is, it I'm, uh, tiny. it's working at least though, so. Yeah. It's, now it's up to user error. So that sets it back to sort of the original thing. But now you can just drag these kind of around and kind of dial it in, uh, you know, in 
close to real time. It depends on your computer, but it's not as exacting. Um, but I mean, it doesn't get any faster than that to just kind of drag around things and you can raise the blacks a bit, whatever you want to do. You can tint the blacks. Um, I think by dragging this around a little bit, you want to tint the blacks a different color. So uh, eventually I'll work that into these because that's nothing, nothing hard to work in, but, but it's pretty quick though, right? It's pretty, it's much easier than opening up, uh, uh, you know, this whole, they got this color correction thing, which this is great, but it's just a bunch of numbers. It's not exciting. It's not, uh, I don't know. it's not flashy. It's not fun. It's more of a utility. <laughs> But this just makes it a little easier, quicker, especially having it as a node group, I can just drop into anything. So, so that was something I came up with. And uh, I guess after this, I could, we could put a link up on Blender Artist. I can put it on Dropbox or something. People can grab it if they want. Um, unless, uh, unless you want to go ahead and figure out all this on your own. It's <laughs> no fun. Um, we, can, we can put it into, once we post the YouTube events, we can put it into the notes. Cool, um, cool. Um, okay, so yeah, that was the little color correction thing I came up with, and it's, it works for everything. Um, before I came up with this, I'd come up, I, I always wanted a way to control black levels individually from the rest of the color. So I'd come up with like nodes, uh, like a limiting node, so I can clip everything to one and zero if I wanted, and I came up with stuff for, for black levels and things like that, and adjusting the color. A lot of, black levels is one of the biggest things in compositing when you're matching two different things that were shot separately. Uh, you know, if, if, even if the colors are generally on, if the blacks in the foreground thing are slightly redder and then the background is slightly greener or bluer, it's never going to look right. And that's one of those subtle things people always see and they're like, it just looks like a composite, but you can't put your finger on why. It's usually stuff like that. So uh, I had come up with all these black level control node groups. And then uh, then I when, when Sergey helped me with this, it all just now it's all in just one thing. It's really nice and easy. So, uh, so yeah, question. yeah. So I know, like a nuke or an After Effects, whenever you mouse over areas of the image, you can get your per pixel value. Yeah. Is there a way to do that here? I think so. Yeah, I think if you hold down Control, right? No. Or, shift. or is it Shift? Uh, it's something in here. Oh, there is a way. Yeah. The uh, if I do this. I mean, yeah, if I just, if I, using the backdrop, there is a way of using the backdrop with a, uh, using some key thing, but if you have a viewer open, you can just click and it just shows it all. Yeah. There is a way, and I, somebody, because I, when I first made a little demo video of this and sent it to that effects list, um, Bartek Skrupa, I don't know if you guys know who he is, he does a lot of compositing stuff for, for Blender Cookie. Uh, he wrote back saying, great video, but here's how to do the, here's how to bring up these little readouts in the backdrop. And he gave it to me and I haven't used it since. So I totally forgot it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's something, uh, man, it's so easy once, uh, it's none of these, not, there it is. Yeah, alt, alt left and click. So there you go. Uh, yeah, so that's useful too. So yeah, so that's some color correction stuff. And then uh, film grain, if we have time. We have, yeah. 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 Right on. This is this is uh, this is a weird. Uh, I've been working on this one for a long time. Uh, I, I would have it working one way, and then they'd release an update to Blender, and that way it would stop working, uh, yeah. and I could never figure out why. Uh, hmm. So this way has been working recently. If uh, if you go home and try, and it doesn't work, it beats me. So. Uh, I'm going to switch over to the compositing because I'm, I'm just going to do it on this default. Uh, the default. Can I slide this down? Oh, oh. one. Oh, come on. This is what I wanted. Is that me? I don't know what that is. I'm guessing. Like a phone call today. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh, like should I answer it? <laughs> is it on here somewhere? Hello, so like this is the LA Blender Group. Yeah. Skype or something? Okay. Uh, use nodes. Uh, so if we render this, all we get is our default cube. So it's exactly what we'll put green over. Um, so the way I found to do this is to uh, make a material and then just use uh, the noise node textures uh, to basically create the noise pattern and then bring it into the compositor as a texture. Um, you have to save it as a, 
uh, false user, is that what that's called, fake user? So it doesn't, uh, yeah, yeah, because you have to create a material uh, that's applied to something to create it, but then you, you know, like I'm, I'm gonna do it to this box. Um, can I move this over here, is that all right? Yeah, move it wherever you need it. Right on. Um, like I'll put it on this box, I'll just, I'm, I'm not even switching to cycles, I haven't actually tried it in cycles to be honest. Um, Shave. Uh, you know what? None of this even matters. Um, we just need uh, here material. Uh, we don't even have to give it a name. We can give it. I guess we can give it nodes. Uh, and then we go to textures, nodes, and this I'm going to call noise, film grain, whatever you want to call it. You always get the nice checker by default. Don't need that. Like there, there were versions where I used, every time I would delete that checker node, Blender would crash. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't figure out what. So, so I've never shared this online or anything because it's always so unstable. Um, but I bring in three noise textures. So I'm just, just made a noise texture, duplicated it. Uh, back up. Oh, you know what? I don't need that thing. And then two mix RGBs. Plug them all in together. I'm basically just layering all these uh, all these noise. Once I plug it in, you'll see them all. And then one we're going to change to red only. The other one we're going to change to blue only. And the last one, or I'm sorry, the middle one was green. This is blue. There we go. And then um, what is it? Black. Mix them. Yeah, just mix them into a five. So you can see. The output of the actual texture is like red, green, and blue all mixed, uh, which is exactly what we want. So that's basically it for the texture setup. Uh, I used to play around with like overlay and changing this background color to grays, 50% grays, and all that stuff. And at times it's worked, at other times it hasn't. So this is what's working for now. It's like mix 0.5, leave the backgrounds black. Um, another cool thing though, this is interesting, is if you if you do change these, I didn't ever knew this. So I thought I'd share it. It's silly. Um, everybody knows you can like kind of hover over this and hit control copy, control V, and it'll paste the color. But there's an even better way. You can just click and drag, and it'll do that, which I never knew about. I just learned that this week. That's awesome. So that's something useful. Uh, so all right, we got the texture set up. We called it noise. Go back to compositing. Bring in a texture node. Uh, if I could follow, input texture, and we're going to grab that noise. And yes, yeah, so there it is. And if we put it over um, color mix, normally what you want to do with noise, at least in other programs or whatever you've done, is you won't usually overlay it. Um, hmm. But here it's going to be really dark because it's over black, so it's not going to look right. Uh, so what you have to do is well, this is my cheat for it is put it over top of white and switch this to color and that way it will only put the the uh it's putting it gets rid of the black basically leaves all the color you overlay it uh your brightness because there, there's been times where uh i've had if i do 50 percent gray or something it makes the whole thing darker it makes it brighter it always it's always been tricky so this seems to work without altering the brightness um too much, so. Uh, is that a viewer? No, viewer, can you viewer? Viewer the nodes. No, oh, come on. There we go. Uh, so yeah, hopefully it's not, yeah, it doesn't affect the brightness too much other than just, you know, what it's generally overlaying. And then, uh, you know, you can always throw on a, a soften, which makes it look a lot better renders that always looks good and then set this down to like whatever 0.25 or something something really slight for film grain and, uh, and there you go and the nice thing about this noise texture is it changes on every frame so it'll automatically just kind of chatter the way film grain does um, and I'm sure you could also uh, like film grain has a tendency where the blue grain is much bigger and chunkier and uh, I'm sure you can do that here with color correction nodes and stuff and you can even uh, do some pixelate. Um, there's a technique for doing pixelation where you scale it down. Uh, 
put in a pixelate node to break the concatenation, whatever that's called, and then scale it back up so it makes the, the grain um, pixelated, basically. Uh, so you can do sort of like a digital kind of noise look and all that. So, uh, But yeah, you want to make sure on this material you hit fake user, and uh, I would do it here too, just or oops, did that wrong. But Oh, well, I duplicated it, but anyway, should have hit the F. But, uh, that's good. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, there's a lot of options. It it just creates a nice little base noise texture that you can then just do whatever you want with. So, uh, and you, what I've done when I've used this to generate noise in the past is I would set this up, um, render it out on like a 50% gray card, and just render like a 50 frame sequence of it, and then all my Subsequent compositing projects, I just bring it in as a frame sequence, set it to overlay, dialing the opacity, and and it's yeah, because then it's done. But uh, but this is a way to generate it, which uh, hopefully hopefully nothing changes, and this way keeps working for a little bit now that <laughs> now that I've shared it. So um, so yeah, so that's that's what I've got for now. That's uh, some compositing things. Awesome. Any questions? Thanks, John. Oh sure, sure. Any for yeah. Any questions? Anything? Any other compositing, anything? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, you've been using After Effects for many years. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what's your opinion about the selective color options? In, uh, in, in After, After Effects? Effects? Yeah, there is like a particular tool for color correction. Mm -hmm. It's called Selective Color. OK. Have you ever used it? I've used the change color. I don't think I've used selective color very much. But I've used okay. change color, where you pick a color, and then you can adjust. I tend to not use it. I tend to use. Um, at least for changing a color like that, like if I wanted to only pick the reds and change it to green, I tend to use the uh, the hue correct uh, hue and saturation thing. Just go to if I'm, if I'm changing a red shirt to green, I would go to the reds, isolate it, uh, and then just hue shift it there. Because uh, to me, those always get better fall off. Like you have more control. Um, like they, those other ones, uh, at least change color has like a threshold slider, I think. Um, and they That's just seem, like yeah, and they seem, this, the threshold sliders always bug me that you can't, uh, you don't really get fine control, it's just whatever. But the, the hue, saturation one, you get that on each side of the main color you're changing, you can you can shift the main color, and then you can also shift the fall off differently on each side, and I like that, so mm -hmm. I tend to use that. But is that what the selective color does, kind of? Is it for changing colors, or? Yeah, but uh, by channel, so you can, for example, Change the colors in the middle or highlights or red, green, and blue or cyan. So it allows you to tweak very much the, the color spectrum in different ways. Huh, cool. Yeah, I'll have so to check it out. Now, right? I was asking you this because I've been using that many, many times. And I was trying to replicate the same functionality in Blender, and I couldn't find a tool that it was like having the same small options and I able to tweak so much with such a small uh, amount of options. So I was thinking maybe to create a custom node to have the same functionality as yeah. using in, in After Effects. Yeah, that'd be very so cool. That's why I was asking you if you heard. No, no. I'll check it out now, though. And if it, uh, if I can contribute in any way, or if I can at least bug Sergey to figure out the math <laughs> part, uh, I'm sure maybe we can get something going on it. So, cool. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I'm sorry, I was, yeah. I was in like photo mode there. Did you show sunbeams? Or? Oh no! Do you want to see sunbeams? Well, right. We can do sunbeams. I know it's a small feature. It is, and I feel like it's it's like it's the only feature the compositor got in this round, so it's like uh, everywhere. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. funny. Everybody's like, uh, I, I know it's like it's very two D compositor feature, but everybody's volumetric crazy at the moment. So every yeah. time you see God rays, you're like, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Image. It's just 2D. Um, I, oh, nice. <laughs> it's, you know, we, have, we have volumetrics on GPU now, so you know, if you wanted to create actual god rays, it doesn't take three days. Yeah. <laughs> but this is, uh, let me try this one. This thing kind of has a mind of its own. <laughs> yeah, uh, these Zoom panels are really throwing people. They're like a little bit of day. I ain't got an image. Don't need this. 
Um, <laughs> uh, filter, sunbeams down here. <laughs> so if you just plug it in, the new sunbeams node, you won't see anything at first. Um, so you've got to turn the ray length up a bit, and then you'll see it's starting to do something. And uh, and then uh, this is this is one of these instances where it'd be so nice to have a little widget right down here to kind of control where you put it. Uh, yeah. It would be nice. They, yeah, there's a lot of stuff they gotta fix in the old compositor, but uh, that would be the ability to be able to like. They say that goes back to like some bigger problem, uh, but yeah, I don't know. This is probably a bad image to to Sounds use. Like yeah, totally. Uh, but that that's what they say. They say it's uh, the compositor itself needs a rewrite to be able to do that. To be able to be able to code your own overlays and stuff. Yeah. So somebody somebody there needs to uh, fix stuff. But we can we can do. Um, have, you, have you looked at the compositor targets for Gooseberry? I have, yeah, and that's they, that, those are the things they want to. Well, they they want to get caching and uh, speed up, um, but they really need, it's called we call it canvas compositing. You would need to be able to define a canvas and then move all your elements around in that canvas. That's how every other compositing program works. Um, Blender looks at whatever the bottom image that's coming in. That's your bounds, which is horrendous. Uh, so. Yeah, they're slowly, slowly working on it. Hopefully, uh, but caching and speed up is certainly, uh, certainly wanted as well. I it also. Yeah. There will be hopefully oh. at some point during uh, Gooseberry. Uh, but yeah, this all I'm doing is uh, I'm taking this image because it wasn't the ideal image, and I'm just isolating the bright spots using the color ramp, and then uh, whatever you, goes into it from there is the. Uh, that, like the sunbeam basically just whatever you plug into it that's what it's gonna like fan out basically um, so you you know an image like this that doesn't have uh, you know some of the other images like if you're doing a window in a dark room obviously the window is the brightest spot it may just nail that without any adjustments but uh, but this image has a lot of midtones and stuff so uh, and then you just throw it over top and it's uh, it's super easy Put this over top so to add, because light usually works like that, but then yeah, you've got your you can So it's kinda it's kinda like a like a radial blur, like set the zoom and after effects, right? Uh kinda yeah. Like it's more patterned after um well, I shouldn't say that, they don't like them. Uh there's a tool by trap code called Shine. Shine yeah. And it's it's more that kind of ideal. No, nah, not as many yeah, settings, a bit more main. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, and this is exactly what this Keller ramp is doing. It's like my threshold setting. Uh, so whatever's going into it, and uh, you know, it doesn't. The node itself doesn't do the composite itself either. It just generates the element. So then you've got to still add it over top. Um, but it is nice, and you can get. Uh, you know, you can animate these. Of course, uh, I, I pushed a little bit for a factor input so that we could track something, bring in a track node, and just plug in the X Y into that but that hasn't happened yet so uh, the guy that that wrote it uh, um, Lucas is doing all uh, the new hair stuff for gooseberry yeah Lucas Tom what's that yeah 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 um, so yeah so that's uh, that's sunbeams it's pretty useful he's also Lucas is also the guy working on particles right uh, That's been like his long, yeah. He's been on been that for like project. as long as I've been into Blender. Uh, he's been working on that. So, yeah. So someday, uh, but I'm I'm hope he, you know his specialty is the compositor sort of, and apparently hair. I didn't know that. I thought he was just a compositor guy, but um, him and Jerome are both like the compositor. Guy. And Sergey now is part of it as well, uh, and. Uh, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully more things are coming. So Sean, before you sign off, do you want to plug anything online, any projects you're working on, no. your website, nope. anything like that? You got some CG cookie tutorials out? I do. I have a I have a tracking one I did last year. It's kind of like if you if you want to use uh, the tracker in Blender, 
just for compositing if you don't want to be rebuilding full 3D sets. Uh, I did a whole course on Blender Cookie for that. Um, and I'm currently working on a rotoscoping course. I'm trying to be as thorough as possible with all the tools and as many different, you know, real world use projects as I can come up with. Um, and it's pretty gigantic, so it's taking a long time, but uh, I'm kind of a third of the way through it, maybe. So hopefully in the next, I would say, month or two, maybe by Christmas, it would be up, I would hope. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, so it'll be as comprehensive as it could possibly be for for Blender, so. Yeah, on some Roscoe, a lot of Roscoping After Effects and the Blender tools for that are super cool. Yeah, they're great. Like the ability yeah. to be able to like track like individual notes of your mask to like, yeah, it yeah, it's really useful. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. Any other questions for Sean? Or Anything? Uh, All right. Sure thing. Sure thing. Yeah. Sure thing. All right, so uh, we're about an hour in. Um, we're on schedule. You guys want to take a short break? Should I pop this thing? Uh, or keep break. on plunging? What do you think? Actually, keep on. We're going to keep on going. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, time lapse animation using oh, HDRI oh, sequence environment map. OK, so we've had some folks step out of the room. I'm just going to wait till they're back in. In the meantime, uh, I'll show you guys a this is the trailer for the Architecture Academy. Some of the models that I'm showing are from that course. Um, um, this is Andrew Price. You're seeing good plants and trees and everything. Um, So, uh, so he offers the course in a couple of different formats. Let me see if lots of questions. All right. So this site is a little weird. Uh, let me see if I can get to the main page of his site. Um, so he offers the course in, in a couple of different forms. You can uh, you can buy it uh, either. Kind of, I think there's like a silver and a platinum, and the platinum part of the course comes with uh, material libraries, a bunch of extra stuff like um, models that you can drop in. Uh, the introductory module of the course is really great. You create a lounge room, which is this guy, and he smartly provides a, <clears throat> a lot of the little detail. So you get through the first module quickly and stay motivated. Some of the stuff is like that's like a photograph of the Venice Pier on the wall in the background, but a lot of, a lot of the stuff comes from him. You do all the class simulation. The scene is lit by an HDR uh, in the back, and it's intentionally blown out to try to just hide what's going on through the windows so that you can focus on the interior. Um, I will say, in critique of the course, uh, some of the lighting is probably not optimal. So, as an example, um, this scene, which is also part of the Architecture Academy. Let me pause. Uh, some of the lights that he, he uses a couple of experimental techniques in the lights, because I thought he, he just thought they were cool at the time. And they really play hell with cycles. So trying to get a noise-free image 
uh, from these scenes is really challenging. Um, in fact, I've been playing around with this scene this week with some adaptive cycles patches uh, that have just come out. Has everybody been playing with those? So this is the uh, holy grail of, well, one of two holy grails of cycles, like bidirectional path tracing and path tracing mm -hmm. and was it Metropolis Light Transport? I think people are trying to get to. Um, but right now, uh, we have a unidirectional path tracer, and we have uh, a, a tile setting where if you want to get a clean image, you have to set some high tile size, and then every tile gets exactly the same attention, regardless of how much noise there is in it. Right? And of course, with an image like this, you're going to get all sorts of noise, uh, fireflies in various parts of the image. So um, what adaptive, cycle, uh, adaptive samples does is it uh, will, you set a confidence value, and it will look at each tile individually, and then the subpixels within that tile, and it will focus the attention where it's needed to clean the image. Um, it's, uh, I, I have to say I'm getting mixed results with it right now, so it's, it's kind of unclear whether there's a big speed increase or a small speed increase or any speed increase at all. I've been posting my, uh, my test results online. Anyhow, um, I've been playing with this, and it's kind of cool. It'll, it'll, uh, there's a stop value that'll stop on the different tiles based on how clean you want it to be. Um, That's a post effect. It's like a post cleanup. Uh, no, it's it's a core change to the render uh, kernel. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so what can I show you? So um, here's the actual scene itself. So what are we at? Uh, 3 million verts, 2.7 million faces, it looks like. So it's going to chug a little bit on my poor little laptop here. Um, what I did was uh, I was playing around with lighting. So the scene is, in, the pool deck scene is inherently lit by an HDRI. And I should probably just give you guys, give you guys a little backgrounder. So um, HDRI, for those that are not familiar, this is a high definition range image. Um, image based lighting is pretty much uh, come out of left field in the last few years and become like the de facto way that you light uh, a lot of scenes, shiny objects. Uh, it's a, um, <clears throat> this is the Wikipedia definition. So it's an image of great dynamic range. Uh, what it allows us to do in CG, so just a, a quick background here is uh, you can take an image with multiple stops and then compress it down with software so that you're able to bring out dark spots and light spots. So uh, people in the room that knew all this already, <laughs> I apologize. Um, but uh, CG inherently works in high definition. And uh, there's a bunch of software that will allow you to kind of take your own photographs and do it yourself. Um, I've brought a book in here uh, that's by the guys that run uh, HDR Labs called the HDR I Handbook. You can see the spine is relatively unbroken, so I've yet to take this behemoth on holiday with me for the sheer weight, but uh, you're welcome to pay, pay to that. They have a website with lots of HDRI sky maps that you can download for free, um, cityscapes, uh, interior scenes, and so forth. Um, GIMP, I don't think GIMP, unfortunately, does not deal well with HDRs or any uh, kind of high definition images. But this is the kind of effect that you can get with them, right? So you map them into the CG environment, and you're able to do environment reflections, uh, the sources of light in the photograph itself, light your images, and you get shadows cast and that kind of thing. Uh, these two images come from Blender Cookie. There's a couple of tutorials on HDR lighting there. They come in two different forms, a mirror ball uh, and an equiangular. These are actually really easy to make, these mirror ball images. Um, if you go online at gardening supply places, you can get these chrome mirror balls. You know, you can get, get these for like super cheap, like, you know, 12 bucks. And then you take your DSLR and you can actually photograph any environment. And what happens is, in the strange way that light works, you actually capture a 360 degree of the environment, and it just gets more and more compressed towards the edges. And then you can uh, take that image and still use it to uh, environment light your shot. 
I've made some of these, and uh, it's really, really straightforward. The uh, professionals, when they create these things, they use many more stops <laughs> than an amateur like I would do. Does anybody have experience in uh, creating your own kind of HDRIs for CG? Yeah, I got one of these Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Um, so that uh, so pros will use actual metal chrome. I think it's uh, there's like these industrial balls that you can get that are super heavy, right? Uh, the kind that I was using was like the cheap hollow has uh, kind of variations on the surface, so you don't get the perfect image. How uh, how much was your ball that you? Yeah, like $10. Like $10, yeah. But I bought it in Spain, so it was in euros. But no matter what, it was also very, very cheap. And it was one of these Christmas ornaments, you know? <laughs> but not like a small one, like big one, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And There's, it, although you can get HDR SkyMaps for free, you could also get professionally done ones. Um, <clears throat> one of the sites that offers these is a, a company called Hyperfocal Design. Uh, it's a gentleman named uh, Jay Weston uh, out of Adelaide, Australia, I think. Um, and he, in addition to taking sky maps, he also does time lapse HDRI shots. So uh, he has a series of products, um, uh, one of which he shared with me just for demonstration purposes. Uh, it's called uh, Afternoon to Night. So it is 863 individual HDRI photographs one every second for 20 seconds, which causes a time-lapse effect. Um, he does lots of uh, color checking, and uh, I think he actually uh, ticks off the bottom, blacks out the bottom of the HDRI image, which is usually recommended. Um, anyways, uh, he sells it online. It's, it's enormous. I think it's like 46 gigs or something. Um, so I downloaded it because like a great internet connection, but you could also kind of have it sent to you on USB. Um, so let me just show you what something like that. Well, send you a, a so this is a single frame uh, from that, and this was actually produced by me the other day when I was uh, messing around with this adaptive samples. Um, so it's got the sky, you know, you get shadows, the whole deal. Um, this is a video. Yeah, so, so what you'll see, uh, mostly because I didn't give it enough samples, is when the sun comes out, there's this kind of strobing effect, and you'll get uh, more noise. Um, and that's, you know, I'm not sure why she shot this on such a, uh, an excessively cloudy day, but you can see, like, the shadows moving across the scene. You can see the sun uh, coming down in the reflected windows. The clouds kind of moving across the horizon. And as soon as the sun dips, uh, you get a sunset briefly. And then I, I started animating the lights coming on. And then uh, what you'll get in the background is you'll actually, as soon as the clouds start to clear, is you get uh, the moon kind of rising. That's oh, so cool. Yeah, I wish the moon was larger, but, uh, but there you go. I guess probably the nature of how I shot. But, uh, but yeah, so obviously, um, you know, if you can use a, a number of these different sequences to get uh, different kinds of effects, right? City lights, all the rest of it. So um, the way that you enable that in Blender, start with a new scene. Okay, so switch to the Cycles Render Engine. <clears throat> Let's say I wanted to light the scene. We use nodes, select an environment texture. Uh, pick your HDRI, which... Uh, there's probably like 100 HDR max with the Architecture Academy pack. Uh, I have used some of their HDRs. Uh, I didn't, and actually for the pool scene, the default HDR comes from them also. Uh, so, but these ones <laughs> were from Hyperfocal Design. Uh, but yeah, I, I've definitely used their HDRs. Um, so what I wanted to show you here was, you know, adding an HDR to a scene is, is really no big deal. You select environment texture, you pick your HDR. This single image is where you select image sequence, and then you get another drop down. And if you're selecting, you know, a range, you just give it, you know, it was 863 uh, starting, um, auto refresh. And then you could basically jump to each one of those frames and do a render, and you'll get whatever 
that time lapse shot was that he took. So that's. What is the auto refresh? Uh, that is a great question. Yeah. Always refresh image on frame changes. Oh, is that a preview thing? Or that <clears throat> it's a freebie thing. So when you're when you're jumping around on your timeline here, that kind of auto refreshes. Um, so one of the things that uh, hyperfocal design recommends is to increase your map resolution with multiple important sampling. And effectively, what it does, as I understand it, is it creates a light map of uh, across the photo, recognizes bright spots where the light sources are, and then samples them more in those areas. So it effectively reduces noise uh, in the resulting render. <clears throat> the what I found was uh, I think he recommends you know you bump it up to like two oh four eight. I just kept cranking this thing up uh, and, until my GPU until cycles complain my GPU was out of memory. So I just kept going and going and going. Oh, just backed it off slightly, and it doesn't increase any render time at all, and it dramatically decreases noise. So I highly recommend you check this out if you're doing image based lighting. <clears throat> Any questions? What, what value did it crank it up to? Ooh, I think. Well, let's take a look. Uh, I think it was like it was. Uh, let's see. It was some multiple of some multiple of one hundred two four. I think I went up to seven. Any other questions? Um, that video that you showed. Yeah. Uh, the HDR video of the clouds. Uh huh. This one. Do you know how many uh, f stops are using? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I think he, let's see. So these are all the different ones that he does. I, should, I probably should have known this coming in, but um, it is on the website. Okay, let's see. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> oh, there is 16. Or is that 16? Uh, yeah, there you go. There you go. It's 16. So this is with a DSLR or? Yeah. So he uses a DSLR on, uh, yeah, on a tripod, and he's probably got. Um, no, that's 16 uh, separate so exposure stopped, values. Stopped, he's stopping up and mm -hmm. down 16 stuff. Yeah. Probably, probably so what is, this, what is this middle, what is this correct exposure? I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, it's super friendly, very approachable. I recommend you know, if you guys are interested, uh, reach out and uh, yeah, check out his product. Um, I would love to show maybe one more thing here. Let's see where are we at, 1230. Yeah, let me, let me show something here. I'll, you guys interested in seeing the adaptive samples thing? All right, uh, so let me open up a different version of Blender. Is it similar to the branched path tracing? It is not. So, so branched path tracing allows you to control uh, more at a fine grain level things like bounces for, you know, transparency and all, all the rest of that. I'm using that on pretty much every shot I'm doing. Yeah, it, hel it helps a lot. So there's there's people in the forum. We're all still trying to figure out like what settings are messing with this feature, <laughs> and I think <clears throat> one of the settings that might be messing with it is the kind of Russian roulette of saying, "I want three to 128 bounces." Uh, so people to do testing are kind of setting their bounces to start uh, their min and max values to the same. So uh, branch path tracing might be messing with this. But it's it's different. So let's go into here. Let's see. We're going to build. So there's this special build that you can get. Uh, he's the the publisher has put it up online. Uh, no, it's a gentleman named Lucas uh, that I'd not heard of before, uh, and he's been getting inspired by the same uh, white papers that have been used to develop Lux Render and uh, and actually Dade who's like the main developer on Lux has been chiming in on the thread, giving him suggestions on direction and that kind of thing. So, uh, oh good, I knew I had Mike Pan's BMW scene somewhere. 
So for, for those of you that aren't familiar with Mike Pan's BMW scene, this is uh, like <laughs> the de facto test file uh, for doing cycle stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so what you'll find, let's see. So I'm going to leave a lot of the default settings here. But uh, under sampling, to use adaptive sampling, normally what you would do is you would crank it up to something outrageous, like 10,000 samples, which may not be too outrageous. I've like, gone to like a million and just use progressive refine before. So, and you get this additional uh, checkbox in here, which is um, once you select adaptive sampling, uh, you get a couple of options here. Adaptive distribution is more for GPU uh, large tiles. So when you're running with CPU, obviously you're using like 16 or 64 size tiles. When you're using GPU, uh, you're probably using 128 to 256 or something in that range. So this allowed, this adaptive distribution is looking inside the tile to find the, the fireflies within that. And you have a confidence value, which ranges, uh, default is 80, but uh, as you go towards 100, uh, it decreases the stopping value and therefore increases the quality. And it's all based on the perception of uh, fireflies within your image or noise within your image. Uh, the max update rate is how often it resamples the image to find that. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just testing with, let's see, should we do a quick test here? So what was this set to? This was like 200 or something? What was the, uh, the default? 200. 200. So when you say your sample's high, is that saying that's the max that it will use? So adaptive sampling will... Or is it yeah, it'll sample? stop long before you hit that sample number uh, when it determines that the image is clean enough. Clean enough. Yeah. So I'm going to down down here under performance and I'm going to select progressive refine. So for those that aren't familiar, uh, if you don't select pro progressive refine, it will use the standard tile based render. Um, and it'll show you one tile at a time. Progressive refine gives you the whole image and then refines it. Uh, it's much slower typically. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I'm going to just see if we can. I don't know, my poor little laptop here. We'll see how fast this thing. Three, four. All right, it's going to take some time. Rather than make you sit through six minutes of that, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll just turn on adaptive sampling. We'll see what this looks like. So what you'll see is there's a, a first pass that happens where it, it renders everything and then it goes back and revisits the tiles that require the, the cleanup. Uh, so hopefully this will, mm, so yeah, hopefully this normally completes in just a, a couple of minutes, but I, I'm finding it's it's working, but again, it's just unclear. We just need to test the lemon heck out of it. And it is, it's a time decrease when you do that? It is, yeah, I mean, that's, well, there's, I, I see there's kind of two values for this. Um, I'm a progressive refine guy. I usually, you know, I've got like a three GPUs in my system and I, I usually just hit progressive refine, render, and then I go back to work on something else and I'll come back every now and check and see how it's looking. Um, so I think what I like about the progressive refine is that it gives you better estimation on when you'll actually reach a reasonable looking image. So, uh, and, and it'll stop your render at that time. So, any questions? So, yeah, and so I mean, do you know what, like a comparison between the render times with it on or off? Yeah. Or is, that, or is it hard to determine because you use the Basically what I'm seeing is like, uh, if the 10,000 sample render took 14 minutes, the adaptive refine is taking about three minutes. In addition to double three minutes. Uh, that, that's a comparison to without adaptive sampling, fourteen. Oh. With adaptive sampling, uh, roughly two, like I'll say three, three minutes or so. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it's done with the first pass, and you see this confidence level up here. Uh, so he's recently been reworking the UI on this. Um, the confidence level used to go drop down to whatever level you had it at. Now I think it's, I don't know if it's going to zero, it looks like. 
but you can see it's revisiting, you know, these tiles because it'll it'll revisit the reflection of the floor down here. It'll revisit this headlight and the, um, the windshield and so forth. So, that's, yeah. So fingers crossed, uh, it works out well. I, I'd say go check out the thread if you're interested. There's a bunch of guys testing a bunch of scenes, and there are some that this will not help, and they're using clamp settings in addition to this to try and clamp some of the, the crazy outlying cases. So that is what I had. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I mean, they're keeping Oh, I'm glad you like it. Well, um, you're ready to your brains for a second. <laughs> it makes a difference. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you didn't I started actually looking to say the I'm Okay, uh, so for folks online, thanks for hanging in with us while we had a little break there. Um, Sean, do you want to uh, do you want to show your add-on? Let's let's do some add-on potluck. Um, I'm, I I found uh, this thing called UV squares. Does anyone, does anyone know who that is? It's it's amazing. It's, I've been looking for it for years now, and uh, and that somebody has it. Uh, I mean, I I just bought it off Blender Market last week. Um, uh, delete that. I hope I can quickly set up a, a good demo of it. Um, Right scale, blah, blah, blah. And if I, if I just quickly mark out some. I, if it's, if it's, have you added it? Not yet. I will in uh, a second. Right. I'll get there. Cool. Uh, I'm just marking some seams because we're going to, it's a UV tool because I'm, I'm not a big UV person. I, if it, if I can't get it on like the first or second try, then I get real frustrated. <laughs> Yeah, it's a pain. So, um, so this tool's amazing. Let me go find it. If I user preferences, add-ons, install from install from file. Sean, here it is. UV squares. Uh, install from file. Hopefully that works. There it is. Turn it on. And now, when I, uh, you know, normally if you if you have a sphere or something like that, and you're select it all, UV, unwrap, right? You get this kind of thing. This thing's always in the way. You get this sort of thing. Um, and maybe you want, uh, oh, gee, get those out of the way. You want this to be like nice and, you know, a grid. And normally I'd, I would sit here and I would just, I'd do this thing, like where I select a row. Um, what is it, Control W or something? No, no. Is it W? w. Is it just W? Yeah, and then a line Y, line X, and you go down each row, and then eventually you've got. But uh, but with the uh, with UV squares, you can just select that whole thing and just hit uh, to grid by shape. Boom. And that that's the only button I've used on this whole thing. <laughs> and that's that alone. It, it's I would buy it if it was five times the price it is. I would have bought it still because that just bam. That's amazing to me. So yeah, and there's there are a few other things up here, um, like ripping vertices and faces. Like I'm not. I don't. If the UV gets into that, I'm like I'm doing it wrong. Um, so that's only available on Blender Market. You say. I, I, yeah, um, I think, uh, I believe so. Yeah, that's where I found it. So, uh, and that's, I wanted to make sure that I had like the most recent 
Um, cause when I, when I just Googled it, I found some older versions and all that. So I wanted to make sure I had the, the default and I wanted to make sure, um, I had a place where I knew who wrote it, uh, so I could go find him and talk to him. And if I had any questions or problems or anything, I could legitimately say like, yeah, I bought it. So please help. So, uh, and it's, it's cheap. I think it was like, it was like five bucks or it, it wasn't more than like $9. And to me, that's, that button is totally worth it. So, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, that's my add on. Yeah. I like it. So anybody, uh, whoever's next, I can reset that for you. Oh, uh, Cool. All right. So, it's your thing. Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> that I had to pop out. All right. Okay. So, I'm going to show something simple and fun here. Okay. This is an add on called Peeping Tom. Have you guys seen this? No. So, as soon as you add it, <laughs> it comes Tom. He follows your ass. <laughs> Isn't that great? So for those that don't know, this is Ton Rosenthal. He is kind of the heart and soul of Blender. He runs the Blender Foundation. Um, <laughs> anyways, it's personally my favorite. Uh, that's it. <laughs> There's so many good add-ons. Somebody needs to show F2, I think. Um, Let's see, add mesh. I like extra objects, adding it in. I'm just gonna add, I'm just gonna show this because it's simple. So, um, so you get these kind of extra objects. Um, one of the ones that I like is um, a polysphere. So uh, if you look at this, it's a, a perfectly round sphere. So it's none of that like creating a cube and then adding subdivisions and the rest of it. Um, so just super handy. Um, there's a bunch of uh, other really great shapes that come with this, uh, including all sorts of math shapes. You know, you've got pipe joints, gears, all sorts of stuff. All right, those are my two ridiculously simple add-ons. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, that comes exactly. Extra objects comes with Blender, which is why I, one of the reasons I like it. Um, Come on up. It's also simple and it's for generating like landscapes. Oh, yeah. It gives you like a like a grid and uh -huh. uses like a displays to modify it. It's kind of interesting. Let me see. I think it's built in, but. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. So basically, what it does is gives you this landscape, like primitive. Oh, shit. Sure. Um, which you can, you know, tweak in various ways. Um, to create different landscapes and stuff. You can obviously set the resolution to something different. You can, you know, make the size bigger. There's different algorithms he uses that give slightly different results. Uh, it's just a matter of like trying them out and seeing what um, kind of suits your tastes of what you're going for. Uh, obviously there's like a random seed. So it's kind of an interesting way of, once you kind of get something you like, you can just scroll through the random seed and you know you can generate different variations of a slightly similar uh, shape. Um, this is just you know adds more or less detail depending on what you want. Um, this is kind of not reacting anymore. <laughs> it's not. It's okay. Um, Um, so yeah, you can change the, the height, of course, the, the, you know, the offset, which basically it's kind of like the same as the height, but it gets, I mean, 
when you, when it gets cut off, you can move where it is or where it's falling. So if you want like a like a plateau or like a cliff or something, that kind of stuff. And this one sets where it plat 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 so plateaus at, I guess. So what height it starts to become like um, um, flat in the top. Or if you don't want that at all, you can just go high, 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 and that's it. And you can set the, well, the sea level, which is where the thing starts. It's kind of like, I mean, it's a convenient tool to generate quick, like, little mountains and stuff. It's kind of useful for generating, like, um, environments and stuff. It's interesting. It's simple. It's, it's, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so I have to up that little window. Um, oh, yeah. When you, yeah, when you do... Uh, any any Blender operator, it'll show up here. But also, if you hit F6, you can get the like a bigger, like a bigger. Yeah, that that holds for everything. So if you create like a whatever, I don't know. If you create like a UV sphere, you you here can change the you know the resolution, whatever the radius, the position. But if you hit F6, you'll get this here too, and it's basically the same thing. Um, the the only thing is once you like click out of it and like start creating other stuff, it disappears and yeah, that's it. You just you, you can do it just the, the moment you create a thing. Yeah. Hey Lauren, have you yeah. have you been playing with uh, uh fine as well? Uh a little bit. It kind of yeah, I mean you want to show them real quick? sure, sure. Okay, then add on for it. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so basically, it's like a UI uh, addition that lets you, like, um, uh, yeah, like do some commands that usually are buried in menus somewhere in a quicker way. Um, in this case, that's not a very good example because this one is very handy in the numpad. Uh, but if you're on a laptop, you know, this one lets you like achieve that same quick, quickly, like switching between views without having to, you know, like, well, if your laptop doesn't have a numpad, that is. Uh, but there's other, um, I don't remember the other ones. I didn't use them that much. But uh, basically, this one lets you change the way, well, I mean, the, the transforming tools like translate, rotate, and all that stuff. I don't use this one either because, I mean, the shortcuts are so, I don't know, they become like second nature to you. So this is <laughs> something I never use. But also, I think the goal of this is for people to be able to create their custom ones. Right. And yeah, and also, I think in the last um, Gooseberry Weekly, they showcased like, a, like nested pie menus. Because uh -huh. right now, they're just like, you know, you have like, you hit like a shortcut, and it brings that menu. But this time, you can have like, OK, so when you go this, this creates another like sub pie menu that has some more options and stuff. And that'll be cool for customization as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of how it works. Cool, man. Mm -hmm. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Who's next? Come on, everybody uses add-ons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone use a mesh tool? Yeah. Yeah, let's see some mesh tools. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, actually. Lint is also really good. If you've not used Lint. Oh, yeah. Um, that, that's for, like, like it's, it's like evaluating your mesh and seeing where it has, like, Problem. Yeah, they call it the spell checker for meshes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, maybe after earlier it gets done, we'll bring it up and take a look. Where is it? Uh, is it included? Ah, maybe it is. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Some of that. That's why I, I kind of. It gets tabbed, right? Yeah. yeah. Which is, I don't like that one, for instance. Yeah. So no. used to tab. OK, it. now it's not. Okay. Yeah, so if you search for pi, you could disable that. Okay. Oh. If I can use it. So these guys, this uh, these loop tools. I don't know if you guys are. Does everyone already use that already? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Nice. 
because I like it's the first thing I enable. Uh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to disable that, I'm fine. Well, um, you can try it. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying it out. In the spirit of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so you have these two non-joined um, faces. Okay, you know something else I need to do. Oops, shouldn't have done that. Sorry. But anyways, uh, so you want to join these? Uh, that's the only way I know how to bridge stuff. I don't know. Is there another way to do that? All right. F. Oh yeah, there is a default. No, no, yeah. Well, 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 yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I've, isn't this you? No, no, look for bridge. It's, oh, like an answer. Okay, so there's yeah, another stuff. The, the, the one in Google Tools has more options. Yeah, and can that like differently? Right, I use a few of these. The other one I use is uh, circle a lot to get like a perfect circle. Like if you have like okay. Like a bunch of faces uh word verses. Lovely circle circular. <laughs> I don't know if you guys do you like something like that. Yeah. The space one's super cool to to even out like circles as well. Which one? Space. It's in the Google Tools as well. Oh, really? Yeah. They're all pretty good. I use Rats a lot as well. They're all pretty good. The last one. What is space? The word? Oh, to get even spaces? Yeah. So if you have... Um, so if you have like, like a surface that's right. supposed to be kind of a grid, but it's become like, you know, deformed and stuff, yeah. you can select those edge nodes and say like space, and it basically make them even. It'll put an even distance between each person. Yes. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, like an arrangement. Yeah. But it won't change the shape of the. Yeah, it puts it on the surface. So if it's a curved line, yeah, it's going to be like, that's cool. It's super cool. Also matches it along. And yeah, it kind of changes the topology, but not the shape. But not the shape, yeah. That's cool. So even if you use a face like this. Yeah. So if you, let's say you uh, like divide one of those loops there, like, the uh, there, so you have like really edge loops instead of two, and then you select the. Uh, like what? So, like, yeah, you want to try? Yeah. yeah. So, so, let's say you have like a, like a, like a grid like this, but it's like all. Um, Everything is like, um, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it. Do it. Actually, yeah, you can, you can actually see where you disable it for tab. Go oh, yeah. to all no. on the category. Oh, there you are. Thank you, guys. I think this the pie menu has a lot of potential, but I, I, I kind of, I've grown used to my shortcuts, so. So basically, you just select the edge loops you want to even out. Let's say this two, and then go space. Well, of course, <laughs> missing a couple here. 
I mean, basically, even it's your yeah, surface app, yeah. which is pretty cool. I mean, it's very useful. And the good thing is what Sean was saying, that it doesn't, it keeps your surface uh, as it was, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you had like a, I don't know, like a, what? Mm -hmm. Never mind. Well, the thing is that it, it keeps the, the shape of your thing. It just changes the the, the oh, the, the arrangement. Yeah. Uh, let's see if uh, mesh length is built in. Um, that one then? Yeah, yeah. So, lint, it is not, of course. There's some add ons. I, I seriously wonder why they're not included in the distro. Um, this one I love that it's called um, Glam or something like that. Oh, Glam is awesome. It's super cool. For simulating like total lengths on, on the images. So basically, you just bring the image in, and then you draw like two, uh, you know, two separate like three expensive layers. You draw like like vanishing point, and then basically you, you process your thing and gives you the the total length for your camera. Oh no way! It's super cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Blam. Yeah, blam. All right. Let's see if I can add this real quick. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. <coughs> Oh, uh, oh my goodness. Sorry, guys, my directory structure is all <laughs> over the place. Personal CD, LA Blender. There we go. Mesh lens. Stop and file. Enable. All right, so it shows up under object data properties. So let's go maybe pull up a slightly more, well, let's move this over. There's no good place. There really isn't, no. <laughs> it's just, okay, it's object data properties. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, here we go. So. Uh, so it'll tell you, you know, how many n-gons you have. Uh, checks for, you know, um, tries, n-gons, non-manifold elements, which is nice. Uh, six plus edge poles in your modeling uh, in your topo. So let's bring up something really complex. I haven't checked this particular mesh, so uh, I'm curious what it's going to find. Uh, yeah, look at that. Unsurprising. Um, so I think it's particularly good if you're doing like uh, 3D printing. Yeah, absolutely. Find out if you have a uh, water water type isn't, mesh. Isn't there another uh, specific add? Yeah, there's a specific add-on too for 3D printing that has. Uh, it's very similar, but it's more more tailored just towards 3D printing. Like it'll let you. You know, it'll check the manifold, it'll check the any holes, it'll check wall thicknesses and stuff like that. It's called 3D Print Toolbox. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, so Camel Barton's one of the developers out of Australia, and uh, somebody sent him a 3D printer, one of the vendors that makes 3D printers. And uh, so he developed a bunch of tools to make Blender a little bit more useful for doing 3D printing. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to be able to demonstrate it here because I don't know it well enough. But it's got some pretty cool functionality. So 3D view toolbox. Uh, it just yeah, it shows up in the <laughs> channel on the left. Uh, 3D view tool. Okay, so it's in the toolbox. It's on the left side. Oh, toolbox. Yeah. Got it. 3D printing. Yeah, there you go. So it'll. Oh. Yeah. Non there's your non manifold there. So anyways, it uh, looks like it outputs to Oh yeah. Oh nice. Cool. Different print file, yeah. yeah. Um all right. Anything else? No. All right. Uh what do you guys think of the add on <laughs> the add on uh, what do we call it? Potluck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I you know, we we should do like a feature potluck, right? You know, where people have just discovered a new feature, so it doesn't deserve maybe a whole 30-minute talk, but maybe just five, 10 minutes.
Um, you guys, this uh, completely open to how we can run these meetings better. So uh, if you have a good idea, just come talk to me about it. Um, oh, um, bagels tomorrow. Okay. Fair point. More bagels. <laughs> So uh, JT wanted me to plug, uh, if you want to get on our mailing list, um, SoCalBlender.org, uh, there's a, you could sign up. Um, this is, whoops, sorry. It's got link outs to our meetup sites. But our mailing list is very low volume. Uh, we're usually just announcing when new events come or if there's anything local happening. Uh, JT does a really great job. I've, we've never had anybody spam it. Uh, so it's, yeah. So uh, we protect the privacy of the people that sign up, and you can opt out at any time. So by all means, yeah, jump, especially for you guys, because you're new. Um, let's see. So I think I'm going to pass the reins over to Sam. Uh, Sam, you want to talk a little bit about uh, your visual effects project? Maybe show us your demo reel and that kind of thing? OK. OK, go on up. OK, so this is like the 2013 demo reel. Is this stuff? Yeah, all it, especially some of the stuff is very quite quite old. Some of this is before cycles even with Blender internal. So some of the renderings is not like high end, you know, but it was uh, made all in in Blender mainly.
So I'm going to show you now the latest one for this year. This year I couldn't really spend very much time working on on side projects because I was like having my own my first sorry my main job. constant demand for sessions on that, that stuff. Uh, you know the basics of it. I yeah. can't, I'm, I'm not, uh, I haven't messed I'm not going to ask you to present on the oh. fly. I'm, I'm re I, re can, re I can show the smoke sim on the fly. Yeah. Um, I haven't messed with the heat and texture and on cycles, you know, and I haven't, I, just, I walked through it once, but I, did, I didn't do it enough to remember it. There, uh, there actually is, actually, now that I think about it, um, in the latest version, there's a quick, there's a quick fire feature, so. Uh, in the shader setup? The, it creates a full cycle shader setup. Uh, the shader yeah. setup, I don't, that's what I don't know, but the, the smoke's in my head. All right, object, quick effects, quick smoke. Okay, so we're still in cycles, so if we go to the node editor. Uh, yeah, look at that. Oh, nice. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. super easy, nice. you can tell, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, some of these are really strange. So it takes like a density value uh, attribute and a flame value attribute. Um, but the nice thing is, there you go. We got uh, fire and smoke. Let's go. Smoke, smoke and fire. Oops. There we go. Yeah. So um, creating the materials is the hardest part of yeah. doing smoke and fire sim. So it's pretty awesome that they added it in. That's really nice. But uh, if anybody, uh, so um, particles and maybe not fluid so much, but fire, smoke, particles, those are constantly requested as session topics. So if, you, if anybody feels like picking it up for our next meeting, we'd love to see it. Um, other than that, does anybody else have anything else they want to present? Any lo any projects they're working on? Plug for anything you're doing? Anybody online have anything they want to share before we sign off? Oh, well, you know, uh, the, I haven't really uh, done much more with the site, but uh, so I run your face global jam, and everybody takes three seconds to go from to your face. Yeah, makes it. I don't have a single uh, blender animator. So I've got lots of 2D, lots of clay, clay mode, and uh, all stuff. If anybody would be interested in doing three seconds uh, of uh, your face, you know, we could still use a blender animator. I'm keeping a slot open. So. I'll eventually have to do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <So> please. <laughs> there you go. All right, folks. Uh, well, for, for people online, I think we're probably going to wrap 30 minutes early and uh, probably just go into social mode down at the cafe. So thanks for joining.
and uh, we'll try and get the recorded video up online. Uh, cheers, everybody. We'll see you at the next one. Javelian, good Thanks luck with lot. your uh, Portland meeting later today. Thanks a lot, Sterling. Cheers.